Okay, I, in case you don't know, I'm a um, retired professor of economics in Trinity, but I still teach an economics course on European integration. Um, so I want to welcome everyone uh, to the lecture, uh, especially following the unexpected topic earlier, which is close to my heart, labour markets in the EU. Uh, we want in particular to thank uh, Mr. Draghi, of course, President of the European Central Bank, and Professor Philip Lane, Governor of the Central Bank of Ireland. It's a great honour for me and all of us to be part of this very special occasion. Uh, so did you know who you're mixing with? The audience is overwhelmingly uh, economic students in Trinity, undergraduate, MSc and postgraduate. Uh, we also have some staff here and we have the committee of the Philosophical Society, but more about that later. Um, Philip is an economics graduate of this college and he's on a professor of the Whitley Professor on Leave of Absence from the Department of Economics. Um, the first work I got from Philip as a student was in Mickham's term in his senior fresh year. And he handed me an essay then that has had and had all the hallmarks of Philip Lane. First of all, it was extremely intelligent. Secondly, he wrote in an incredibly tightly argued structure. <coughs> and thirdly, he was very sparing with words, both written and oral ever since. <laughs> in fact, I often said to students when they're reading the chapter in the book, make sure you have to read Philip Lane's paragraphs five times compared to everybody else's once. I um, just wanted to say in the presence of Philip and Mr. Draghi, we're immensely proud of Philip's achievements as, as an academic and also immensely proud of his achievements in the world of central banking. Um, now to Mr. Draghi. Uh, I often wonder, any of you who do the European Economy course, why Italy, as a nation, doesn't play a bigger role in European affairs and Eurozone affairs. Uh, I've never been able to work that out, because it's the same size as France, but yet it has much less prominence. Yet, there are some individual Italians who have made a huge pack, impact at a European level. And one of those, of course, is Mr. Draghi. Uh, according to the Financial Times, about a week ago, I had a major review about the turnaround in the Eurozone economy and in the Euro. And they accredited almost solely the reason for that turnaround. Uh, what they called uh, Super Mario, what all of us will call Mr. Draghi. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> um, Philip is going to moderate the question and answer session now for maybe 25 minutes or so. Uh, then after that, Con McCormick, President of the Phil, will make a presentation to Mr. Draghi. Then there will be some closing remarks by myself. So I hand you over to okay. Philip. Thank you, John. So let me welcome you all uh, to this second ECB Youth Dialogue. There's one, uh, a similar event was held in Lisbon back in June, which I think uh, went quite well. Uh, of course, in, with the modern uh, social media and so on, th th there can be a lot of uh, people across Europe uh, following the dialogue this morning. Uh, through the ECB website, so uh, I think that that's great to, to combine the importance of having the physical interaction here at a very local level uh, w with the students here today, but also the, you know, the amplitude of that uh, through, through the web and so on. So I look forward to the dialogue. I'll be calling on a, a, a list of students to, to ask their questions. Uh, time is limited. Um, uh, but I think we, could, we can have quite an interesting uh, exchange. Um, I would also say uh, that Trinity, I think, uh, I always say this wherever I would go, uh, Trinity College has always been somewhere where the students have had a high level of participation in the economics debate, through the student economic review, uh, through various debating societies and so on, and uh, uh, through, through a lot of interaction uh, w w with the staff. Um, I think. Professor Hagen has been very much the leader of that over m many decades, John. Uh, and uh, so it's very nice to, to have this event here today. So let, let's get going. And uh, let me first of all call on Aditya Garg to ask a question. Uh, good morning, uh, President Jaggi and Governor Lin. Um, so f some five years ago, five and a half years ago, um, you delivered what is ex uh, often cited as the most influential speech by any economist in the history. 
And um, during the course of your uh, whatever it takes speech, uh, you mentioned some short-term challenges, and particularly pertaining to the um, how the interbanking system was broken and needed some recalibration. Um, so since then, a lot has changed, uh, especially with uh, Brexit now playing out. Um, so looking back, uh, my question is looking back, uh, how, do you think you've achieved uh, the challenges that you set out back then? And looking forward, what are some of the challenges that you see uh, that the euro faces today? Um, yeah. Well, you, you asked me to go back with memory to, those, uh, to, to that year, 2012. And what, what has happened in the two years before, starting with 2010, uh, was a progressive uh, decrease in uh, trust of the euro as an institutional construction. Uh, the financial crisis uh, in 2000 started at the end of 2007. Um, actually, left uh, in Europe, left uh, countries, governments uh, with uh, very high debt, low growth, and and that. Uh, um, put in question the sustainability of uh, government budgets. It created an, a very significant increase in interest rates, started the recession, and this morphed into a banking crisis. Because banks, some of the banks at least, especially in the periphery, uh, actually had a substantial part of their portfolios invested in government bonds that have lost value in the meantime. That, in turn, became what we called fragmentation of the banking and financial system in the euro area, which basically means that uh, some parts of the euro area had uh, no problem about uh, funding the real economy, the banks were working, and other parts were not. Uh, in other parts, banks were not working. It was a credit crunch. And uh, it meant that when we changed the interest rates, at that time we still changed interest rates. Uh, I remember that the, uh, I start in November 2011, and we changed the first time exactly two days after my starting. And then the second time was a month later in December. So it was pretty clear that it was a drop in credit flows all throughout. But these movements, these changes in interest rates were transmitted into lower lending rates in uh, the core countries where banks were actually functioning, the banking system, with positive effects on the real economy and were not in other parts of the euro area. So the, what was at risk was basically the existence of the euro, or at least what we call redenomination risks. And what was at risk was the unicity of our monetary policy, whereby when we change rates, we expect that this being transmitted in the whole of the euro area. And so the response was, first of all, response to the crisis time, uh, reaffirming, deciding, and the governing council did exactly that through what was called OMT, outright monetary transactions, which was the, um, the uh, implementation of the whatever it takes and address the crisis time, and the redenomination risk was fought, and the challenge was won by the end of 2012. And, and second, and in a sense longer undertaking, was to rebuild the, the, the banking uh, system and the financial system, basically mm, fighting against this fragmentation we had. And that took longer, that took longer. Uh, now we can say fragmentation is gone now, it's, it's gone, has been, uh, uh, I think it basically went uh, about two years ago. And since then we see a gro credit flows growing continuously, though not exceptionally, because in the meantime, and that's the other, the other part of the answer to the crisis, many actions have been taken to uh, make the banking system more resilient. Uh, I would say that since the crisis, the whole uh, regulatory and supervisory framework has been overhauled. And uh, so that 
now we can safely say that the banking system and to some, to some extent also the financial system at large is much more resilient against, uh, against future crises. Which, by the way, was quite important from a monetary policy viewpoint because counting on a stronger financial and banking system allowed a monetary and an extraordinarily accommodative monetary policy to continue for much longer than it would have been possible 20 years ago. Very good. Um, let me uh, turn to the next uh, uh, student uh, on my list, which is Annabella Rourke. Good morning, President Draghi. Um, my name is Annabella Rourke. I'm a senior sophister maths and economics student, and I'm also an honorary member of the College Historical Society. It's such an honor to have you here today and to have been provided with such an excellent forum. Directly to my question, though, um, firstly, a fundamental element of the Euro, and indeed its success, is that of the harmonization of the Eurozone members and their response to economic shocks. This harmonization, however, has been stunted by a lack of labor flows from areas with high unemployment to areas with greater employment opportunities. Do you think the EU needs to move closer to becoming United States of Europe with its own more prominent European identity in order for the Euro area to be truly successful? Thoughts on language, culture, and other social elements are also of interest. Thank you. In a sense, I partly touched on this during my, my, during my speech, but uh, we know that uh, the uh, optimal currency areas concept, as, as was defined by Mandel many, many years ago, I think it was, what, 50 years ago, maybe, uh, was calling for uh, free movement of capital and free movement of labor. Uh, now, we are not there yet, of course. Uh, but uh, uh, if you compare the current situation with 30, 40 years ago, uh, significant progress has been made. The, there are barriers. There are language barriers, cultural barriers, uh, policy barriers. Just think about uh, the a measure that would, would increase the mobility, uh, the portability of pensions. And in principle, I mean, at least uh, it shouldn't be that difficult to construct this system, but there are political uh, obstacles to, uh, to move in that direction as well as on other directions in the labor market and so on. But still, in spite of these barriers, the European construct has, as, as in a sense it, it gave us peace and probably the longest period of peace we ever had since the war, it has shown to be able to gradually, perhaps sometimes slowly, sometimes more, sometimes more fastly, overcome this battle. And um, to some extent, uh, the, what we are seeing, to, I, I'm pretty, in a sense, I'm pretty confident that as we move forward, as the recovery continues strengthening, as unemployment will go down, and um, as uh, curiosity, of the young generation towards exploring job opportunities also beyond the borders of countries will continue, will go up. And Europe provides exactly that framework where this exploration, this curiosity can be satisfied. Very good. Let me call on Rory McStay. It's an honor to have you here as a student, uh, so thank, thank you very much. Um, much of the motivation from the last ECB Youth Dialogue was uh, from innovation. Do you think that uh, new technologies, specifically blockchain, have a role in monetary policy in the future? And if so, how do you think they'll change the monetary policy mechanisms? Thank you. Thank you. Um, I, have to be, I have to confess I'm not an expert, but I can tell you that the, uh, we at the ECB are looking into this, and we've now been looking into this for some time, one, one conclusion is that at this point in time, uh, uh, the, the technology is not mature yet to become, um, to, to be considered in either central bank policy making or in the payment system. Um, so uh, we, have to, uh, we have to look at what progress this technology will do in the future years. But let me also... <coughs> 
now to another dimension of this. If, uh, if, if I'm asked, uh, if I were asked, uh, uh, what is the, uh, in this realm of digitalization, what is the dominant theme today? It's cyber risk. And so we have, uh, I would expect that any innovation, like the one you mentioned, uh, any innovation will be screened from this viewpoint. How resilient is this? Or how much our exposure to cyber risk is going to go up because we embrace a new technology? Maybe I just add one line on that because uh, the history of money, of course, money, you know, uh, all central banks always try to protect the money by you know, fighting fraud, fanti, uh, fighting counterfeit activity and so on. So, of course, with new technologies, that spirit of money, you know, every state, every system has a unique uh, state-backed money, and uh, the protecting the integrity of that, I think, is, is paramount. So, let me turn to uh, Stefano Minetto. Good morning, President Draghi. Thank you for being here and the insightful talk you gave before. I wanted to ask, uh, given your personal academic and professional life in the field of economics, uh, where do you feel the teaching of the subject could be improved, uh, and if so, how? <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Again, <laughs> I must confess that I, I, I left university about 30 years ago. <laughs> so if you ask me where I'm up to date with teaching, uh, the, the type of teaching that's being done today, I should confess my ignorance. Um, w however, what I can sort of pick up from uh, talking to... Uh, to my colleagues uh, who are still uh, students and are still teaching or have been doing so until recently, is that things have changed since the time uh, when I was in my And uh, the emphasis on methods, mathematics, statistics, uh, decreased, especially in the early in the early years of learning. And uh, much more attention is being given to, using simple words, understanding the world, understanding reality, the functioning of institutions, uh, the interactions between um, agents and institutions. Uh, sometimes, I mean, some of you who are more into finance, the working on markets. I think that's, that's probably the change that has taken place, and, uh, and I think it's something that I would agree with. Thank you. <coughs> uh, next on my list is uh, Jonathan Rice. Uh, morning, President Draghi, and um, welcome to Trinity, and thank, thank you. you very much for talking to us here today. Um, uh, my question, um, living in Ireland, we are painfully aware of volatility in, in house prices. Um, and while the central bank's macroprudential policies um, seem to have been uh, somewhat effective, uh, we are si uh, still seeing house price growth in double digits. Um, uh, so given the present uh, um, prolonged period of uh, low interest rates, I'm just wondering uh, whether the, the potential for as, uh, price bubbles is a, a growing concern of the, the governing council. council. <clears throat> I, let me tell you that this very same, I get the very same question in each press conference I do in Germany. <laughs> so it's just, it, which actually shows that uh, house prices are going up, not only in Ireland, but in many, in some other parts of the euro area. Uh, and then, so we asked ourselves how, uh, how uh, systemic is uh, this phenomenon? Because uh, if it's local, uh, then it's another, and I will come to this, then, then it's another, another issue. And the answer so far is it's not systemic. It's actually affecting certain large cities in certain countries. Uh, then you ask yourself, how far from historical averages are these valuations? And with few exceptions, uh, I don't know about Ireland, with few exceptions, uh, we find out that in, in the prices, house prices have re in these large cities have recovered 
from, uh, from uh, troughs where they were for several years. And then we ask ourselves, how much is it due to uh, low interest rates, to, um, to uh, easy mortgages, to, to our monetary policy? And uh, there the answer is that quite often uh, factors like uh, supply shortages, building permits, lack of social housing are the main causes of, this, of these increases in house prices. And uh, the, the other question we ask, we're asking ourselves is, uh, because, you know, to become a bubble, it, it, you have to see, you have to observe a, an increase in prices, but also an increase in indebtedness, in other words, in leverage. And how much this uh, phenomenon of increase in house prices being, is accompanied by an increase in leverage? And the answer is um, not much. As a matter of fact, um, credit, as I was saying before, is, has recovered in the last um, four years now, uh, but it's still pretty uh, subdued if we compare it, uh, not with, with the period immediately before the crisis, because we are clearly having, uh, we're having peaks uh, that were uh, unjustified, but even, I would say, 10, 15 years ago, no, 15 years ago, and so, so historically is not, uh, is, is not excessive, what we would judge excessive. So, um, if there are problems, and where there are problems, they should be tackled with local measures, not through monetary policy. And, uh, and so, and, and what are these measures? Some of them have to do with what we call macroprudential measures. So, you have uh, things like loan to value ratios for borrowers and, and uh, or other, other types of measures of the same kind. And there, the competence is, uh, is, uh, is shared between the ECB and the national central banks. And many countries, several countries, amongst which Ireland, have actually implemented these measures. And they've been, from, yeah, I think I, I said before, it's 2015 it started, in 2016 it was reviewed. So it just, uh, I think the same is, is happening actually in other countries as well, in the Netherlands, I can't remember, and I don't know about France as well, so. Thank you. Next on my list is Conor Parle. Uh, thanks again for coming today, Draghi. Um, so just, I wanted to ask a question about uh, how markets reacted quite sensitively to your speech in Sintra recently. And it kind of shows the importance of clear central bank communications and the further impacts they can have. So my question is, to what extent do you see forward guidance and clear communications as a key component of modern central banks? Well, to some extent, communication has become itself a tool of monetary policy. Um, and it goes, it really goes with being independent. Independence of central bank, banks is, is, a big, uh, is a big institutional change that took place in, uh, I would say, the late 80s uh, and, and through the 90s. Uh, of course, in Germany, the central bank has always been independent. It's, it's enshrined in the Constitution. But in most other countries, was not, where the central banks were not independent. And um, so th they became independent. And with, with independence, you have to have accountability. In other words, central banks are independent within a mandate. We have the mandate of price stability. The Fed, the Federal Reserve, have a dual mandate, price stability and full employment. And then the um, legislators would ask ourselves, how well are you complying with your mandate? And this is one part of accountability. The other part is vis-a-vis -vis the public opinion at large. So communication becomes a very important element of uh, how we comply with our mandate. And together with communication, then the next step is transparency. Communication has to be transparent. Give you an idea of how things have changed. Until 1994, 
the Federal Reserve would change its interest rates without any communication to markets. So markets would have to infer from the fact that things were changing actually in front of their screens <laughs> that the Fed had changed the interest rates. Uh, now this sounds unthinkable today. And, and so this is the, uh, say this is the, the, new, the new world. And, and, and so the new instruments like forward guidance, for example. Forward guidance is essentially based on communication. And that's why, that's one of the reasons why credibility is so important. Credibility means that markets, that the rest, the economic agents at large, believe that things are going to go like you are saying they will. And therefore, they behave accordingly. And, uh, and that's, why, um, that's why communication is important, but also continuous compliance with your mandate and especially independence. If a central bank is being viewed as independent, is also viewed as credible, or at least is one of the necessary conditions for credibility. If a central bank is viewed as non-independent, then is certainly viewed as non-credible, and therefore market expectations will not react according to the monetary policy indications we give. So for the final question, let me turn to Townsend Green Barker. Good morning, Mr. Jaggi. Um, many of us here have just graduated or are in our final year studying economics here at Trinity. I wanted to ask, is there any advice you would like to give to us students who are at the very start of our career in economics? And also, what words of wisdom would you have liked to have known when you were at the very start of your career, Mr. Draghi? Well, that's a very difficult question. I, I <laughs> it's... Um, but, well, the... the, the the advice I, give you, I would give you is just stay curious. Stay curious. Uh, think, uh, learn from the world. As uh, I was, uh, when I was asked about how teaching should be should change, I am only saying what I understand now. The emphasis is more on learning from experience, from the world, from institutions, and stay curious. Uh, curiosity is what drives you to be to explore job opportunities, to explore different environments, and, and also to be creative. So it's, uh, that's the advice I, I, I feel like, like giving you. And, uh, and uh, never lose your courage, of course. Very good. Well, I think uh, that's been a very interesting exchange. With all due respect to journalists in the room, it, it's great to have questions from students uh, as opposed to uh, the, the very important uh, uh, job the media do in uh, communicating uh, ECB policies. Let me turn the floor back to John O'Hagan. So uh, I'm going to invite Con McCarrick, the president of the Phil, uh, who's going to make a presentation to Mr. Draghi. Uh, I want to tell you there is a connection between the Phil and economics. Uh, in the no, maybe five, six years ago, the Phil and the HIST, these are our two big debating societies, compete fiercely every year to host the student economic review debates. Uh, in Michaelmas term, it's against Oxford or Cambridge, and in Hillary term, it's against Yale or Harvard. Um, the Phil people won't like to hear me saying this in, in this competition to get these review, uh, get these debates, that the battle up to date has been pretty equal. So, Con. Good morning. I'd like to welcome you all to the University Philosophical Society here in Trinity College. Um, my name is Con McCarrick and I'm the president of the society. So on behalf of the society, our senior patron, Provost Patrick Prendergast and Trinity College Dublin, thank you all for joining us here this morning to welcome the society's newest recipient of the Gold Medal of Honorary Patronage, Mario Draghi. Every, founded in 1683, the world's most preeminent thinkers, doers and change makers have addressed the society. Every year, the council and members of Phil elect a number of exceptional individuals to the honour of honorary patronage in recognition of their outstanding and significant contributions to their given fields. Today, we are delighted to welcome the president of the European Central Bank, Mario Draghi, to the ranks of our honorary patrons in recognition of his outstanding contribution to the field of economics. 
Recent recipients of this award include Vice President Joe Biden, Chancellor Angela Merkel, and Martin Scorsese. Mr. Draghi has served as president of the ECB since 2011. His appointment to this prestigious position was the culmination of a hugely successful academic and professional career. After earning a PhD in economics from MIT in 1975, he was a professor at the University of, in Florence and a fellow at the Institute of Politics in, at the JF School, JFK School of Government in Har at Harvard University. He has served as Italian executive director at the World Bank and as a general director of the Italian Treasury. Perhaps most famously, he has served as vice chairman and managing director at Goldman Sachs International. In 2005, Draghi became the gov governor of the Bank of Italy, and finally in 2011, he took his place as president of the European Central Bank. Mr. Draghi was listed as the eighth most powerful person in the world by Forbes in 2014, and ranks as the world's second greatest leader by Fortune in 2015. However, we're sure that the acceptance of the Fails Gold Medal will be his greatest honor to date. <laughs> um, so without any further ado, I invite you to please welcome our society's newest gold medalist, Mr. Mario Draghi. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks so much. Thank you very much. I'm uh, especially honored to receive this uh, this medal. Uh, I've um, you told some of the recipients, but there are many others, really, and uh, so I'm especially honored to be in this list. Uh, <laughs> thank you so much. It's really moving. Thank you.